a couple of years ago, um, there were five principles in the design. One of these, first and foremost, is that data is an asset. We will treat data as an asset. The other four, incidentally, are that, and I'm going to refer to those later, as that customer centricity is key. So the customer or end user is central. The third is that business owns the digital agenda. And then the fourth is that we want to build in-house capability, and we'll I'll come back to that later. And then the fifth is that we're going to act our way into the future. So these are the five principles. But let me talk about data initially. And yes, um, you know, there's been much said about data being the new gold, data, data being new oil. Um, and, and to some extent, that analogy is reasonable. <clears throat> uh, also, because uh, the, the likeness here to, is to a raw material, it's important to understand that data is a raw material of this fourth industrial revolution. So as, as far as you can go in with a raw material in quantifying value, uh, you should also think of data that way. In other words, it's not really where the value gets delivered, it's a, where the value emanates from. It's important then to take that raw material, refine it, and produce really the value-added products. And in the case of data, that's typically in the form of insights and ultimately in how you actually impact the business in the form of decisions, actions, and so on. But uh, how are we going to treat data as an asset? Because that's where the value comes from. So in our case, that actually means a lot of things. It means owning data where relevant and driving value from it. That means, uh, you know, um, we will hire people to manage, to monetize data. We will expect and require data from our partners, suppliers, JVs. It also means that, um, uh, you know, de decisions about platforms and data systems will, uh, will be treated as major and important investments as opposed to side activities. Uh, but uh, in a nutshell, data is where it starts. It's not where the value ends. It's actually where it begins. So I'll leave it at that, uh, Jim. Thank you. Hanny Shack or Rob, would, would you guys build on to, to what Hanny has to say? Jim, love to. So, Hani, I love how Hani, you know, if you think about, I'm going to echo his previous upfront statements for sure, right? That was very eloquently said, Hani. And, and just kind of, it's, we're bringing kind of our own individual perspectives on this. And, and I look at where have we been the last several months? And I got to tell you, it has been one of the most difficult times in our industry unprecedented and so what this has forced people to do we've talked about how people change or transform and it's it's data but it's also how we are forming new teams through these virtual environments so all of a sudden now you know we had to in less than 72 hours quote unquote go digital when they said everyone with covid people have to move into the remote home, people in the field, they're gonna be dispersed, they're not coming back into these centralized offices. And so all of a sudden, we knew that we had to survive, we had to keep people safe, we had to continue with environmental stewardship, and we had to get more efficient as we watched the market erode. And it forced us. And so I think the data for us, it's been around automation, and when people think about automation, they think about our standard IoT, but it's been the automation of workflows. It's been not just looking at historical data, but it, we're combining a series of IoT systems with very high-end machine learning and neural nets. And we're also focusing on how do we make the decisions? So this has been a big, it's, I've seen more change with digital in the last three months than I have in the last decade. So. Yeah, and Shaq, it just, Rob, just to add let to me, that. Before I have you add on to that, Rob, before you add on to that, let me be clear with the audience because I know y'all, <coughs> some of y'all or most of you got in a little bit late. Feel free anytime during this webinar to enter questions. I will be seeing them. Uh, we have some prepared questions, but um, if you have a question that comes to mind, send it in and we'll blend it in with the question. 
uh, that we have. I'm sorry, Rob, go ahead. No, 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 no problem, Jim. I, I, I'm just going to say, my cautionary statement is my children don't listen to me, so I, I don't know why the audience should listen to me. But anyway, <laughs> um, I mean, I fully agree with what Shaq and Penny just said. I mean, data is so, so important in, in all of this. Um, and frankly, two years ago, before I moved into this new role, I didn't properly understand that. I knew data was important and I would say data was important, but I didn't really understand why and how it worked. Um, but it's so, so fundamental. Um, I mean, really, we talk about you know, freeing the data, actually having access to the data and, and what Shaq was just describing. You can then put some really smart algorithms and artificial intelligent machine learning on top of it. But if you just fundamentally, if your data is trapped in spreadsheets or on bits of paper and in the bottom of drawers, you, you just can't really do anything with it. We, you know, we, so we talk a lot about free the data, get it into the cloud, and then you can actually um, access it and do all this, all the digital transformation you want to do. Well, I mean, it's so important for us. We've created a data works organization. That's what we do. It's focused on data strategy, sort of data management across our various sort of end-to-end -end data domains. Um, linked to sort of the business workflows, uh, data engineering, you know, creating those pipes to actually connect from where the data is out in the field into our data lake, and then data operations or data services to make that happen. So, I mean, it's just a core, core fundamental part of, of what we need. And, and frankly, certainly from what we've been working on, it's where we've needed to put the most effort over the last two or three years in, certainly in the upstream part of the business. So guys, I, there, there's a request for you to introduce yourselves again, since people got in late. Hanny, can you can you do that again, please? Yeah. Jack sure. and Rob. Sure, real quick. Uh, Hanny Shahawi, Digitalization Lead, Deepwater Technology. And uh, last couple of years, is that's what I've been doing. And previously uh, with Game Changer for also a couple of years, also at Shell, uh, working with startups, entrepreneurs, some of that around digital, but some other. Uh, and altogether, 17, uh, a bit over 17 years with Shell now, and previously with uh, Schlumberger for 15 years. Shaq? Hi, Shishel, please call me Shaq Manning. I'm a vice president at Simrex Energy, upstream oil and gas for technology and innovation. Prior to that, I spent time uh, starting Pioneer Natural Resources Innovation Team. And my history, I cut my teeth being an entrepreneur with two startups and then was a venture capitalist investing in alternative energy and other technology platforms. Rob? Yeah, hi, Rob Kelly. I'm, I'm with BP, 32 years with BP, um, 13 years in the downstream part of BP. I'm actually a chemist, my, my degree, PhD is chemistry, and nine, the last 19 years in the upstream. <clears throat> I guess I've only just joined the, the digital part of BP sort of 16 months ago. Most of my time has been in sort of major projects or operations or manufacturing. So I've been going through certainly the last 16 months of a sort of personal digital transformation that I think many of you will, will be thinking about or asking questions about over this webinar. So I, hopefully I can give you some, some of my personal views of what it's felt like to change. It's, it's very strange. Okay. Thank you, guys. My name is Jim Claunch, and I've spent 35 years plus in the industry. Uh, the last 10 was with Statoil or Equinor, and of that time, the last uh, few years was around implementing digital technology, understanding data management. Uh, I joined Bain uh, Consulting about nine months ago, and it's been great to learn that all the problems I thought were oil and gas only related are really multi-industry related and, and that clearly the, the challenges that Equinor faced were really industry challenges. And so that that is us. I, I want to I want to build on a little bit. You know, you guys did a lot. You know, you talked a lot about data. You talked a lot about new ways of working, Shaq. And so, Rob, talk talk about kind of the, the future of work. What are some of the new positions that that you see as critical going forward? Yeah, and I guess I'll caveat this with there's a sort of a, a reinventing BP going on right now. So there's a complete reorganization of the company that, that Bernard Looney, our new CEO, announced uh, in mid-February. Basically the largest reorganization of the company uh, in the 110 years of our history. And very much sort of upstream and downstream segments are going and we're, we're very much now sort of more more business focused entities that are common across the whole the whole company 
Um, but as part of that, Bernard's talked about putting digital at the heart of BP um, and a lot of focus on that. And certainly the, the roles that we've been uh, creating in our upstream digital organization over the last 16 months will, will reflect that as we go forward. So we're moving to working in a much more agile way. So there are roles in there like agile coaches, scrum masters. Um, we're working in terms of sort of squads and chapters. So we're moving much to a sort of to a tech way of working, certainly within the, the digital part of BP. So product owners, um, you know, a, a different name and certainly different skill sets there. People coming from the business, but also knowing the elements of digital and, and can lead the, the squads as they de develop sort of digital products. Then there's the classic things like um, you know, software engineers, data engineers, data scientists, designers, you know, user interface, user experience, designers, architects, so not building architects, but digital type architects. So you know, a whole range of roles that, that we need and, and you're just consistent with what Hanny said, the idea is to try and insource those within to the company. And we've, the last decade, had that outsourced to various sort of system integrated companies. And really for the stuff that we're trying to develop, really trying to develop it in-house, which means we need to, to bring in some new skills to the company, but also upskill and reskill our own people as well. Mm. Mm. Jack or Hanny, anything that, that you guys would add to that? Jack, you first, if you have anything. Yeah, you know, I think about this and I think about our data science team here at Cimerex and you know, there's always this debate of when you're building these teams or these new skills that are going to be essential for us. You know, thinking about for data science, usually the idea is you want to see someone with five or 10 years experience. Well, the whole industry in a lot of the data science is relatively new. And so what that means is it's kind of a unique opportunity. It's a unique opportunity for people that that, won't, that have this incredible subject matter expertise, maybe in petroleum engineering or in the geosciences, geophysics, where they can start to just take some courses. There's a ton of opportunities online and build those up. And then there's an opportunity for brand new people just to come in and make a huge impact in the business in a relatively short amount of time. And that to me, you know, if we think about the careers, you know, right now, if, if you're a student that's thinking about going into the industry, and I, I know that a lot of people are, are questioning that right now, it's such a tough time, but having some of the data science, data engineering, architect skills, even if it's a small course, you know, that gives you an edge. And I know people that are older might go, well, you know, I mean, they might say, well, is it really, I can't, I'm too old, I can't learn a new language. Well, Python, yes, you can. It might not, you might not have, like I think about a second language, like if when I try to order <laughs> in a different language at dinner, I might not have the best accent, but you can do some of that. And I think that's a, it's an opportunity um, because these roles and career roles are going to be critical for, for the energy upstream, downstream, midstream alternatives, we are going to see continued growth in this in these skill sets. Hanny, anything you would yeah, add? Or? Yeah, hey Jim. Yeah, um, just uh, interesting to reflect on a couple of themes I've heard from uh, Shaq and Rob just now on uh, you know the times we're in are really unprecedented. And in the midst of all that, you know, companies are either uh, find it an opportune or feel compelled to actually transform. In many ways, uh, many of the vectors of transformation have already been there. The writing has been on the wall. If any of you have read the uh, allegory, uh, which is who moved my cheese, which is actually a very interesting one to reread in times like this. It's very interesting because the writing has been on the wall. And in many ways, digital has already been uh, transforming multiple industries and has started to transform the oil and gas industry. Now I think the transformation will uh, happen in full force going forward. So it's accelerating the natural trend of things, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just the other comment I just wanted to add on that is that during that transformation, 
critical success factors to me remain the same, and many of which are manifesting themselves in some of those transformations and others. One of which is capabilities. Capability is defined in the broadest sense, including you know, people, skills, and, and, and that to deliver digital transformation. And the second is your operating model. So in many ways, companies probably have to change form, change the way they're organized, uh, change the way accountability and ownership is assigned to data and otherwise. And the third is really leadership and mindset. And I know we're going to come back and talk about that at the end, but I think these three uh, principles uh, are essential to bear in mind as companies are going to have to find themselves transforming through this time. Good gosh. You know, it's exciting to hear what the three of you guys are saying because um, basically what, what I hear you saying is we're going to look different. We're, we're going to look differently. We're going to work differently. And the interactions are going to be different. And, and so I, I mean, I find it really exciting, obviously. Um, but the, the other thing I want to build on, when, when we were chatting ahead of this meeting, Shaq, um, you, you <clears throat> made the comment that there are misconceptions about data scientists. Talk, talk about what you meant by that. I found that an interesting comment, and I'm certain we have data scientists out in the audience. Yeah, yeah, and I and I think I go back and I think about our data science team, and so you know people have this idea that the you know the data science group is in the corner late at night. They're the ones eating the pizza. They're playing the ping pong games, and that's simply not true anymore. And it's and they're the ones that are having a seat at the table with the other business leaders now, and. You know, the other thing is, is people usually, and especially in larger companies, always think that you have to have a big team. Big team means big impact. And you're seeing some of the data scientists, especially ours, value having small groups. They work very closely together on some very tough problems, but they're completely integrated into the business. And you know, and you're, and that's what I think is, you know, really fascinating. Um, I think that the data scientists also, you know, are very driven by bottom line results. So it's not just, yes, you do have to have the science of understanding and how you're pushing the frontiers, but for the most part, you know, they realize that they're creating a new set of tools and it's moving so dynamically, so fast that they are frantically trying to get their business <laughs> and subject matter experts the next new set of tools because, you know, let's face it, we're under tremendous pressure. So it's, it's very, if you think about what a data scientist might have been, you know, back, back, couple years ago and where they are now, it's it's completely different. You know, and I, I, I think that's a great point. And I think when, when we listen to the new types of position that Rob mentioned in Scrum Masters and Agile, it doesn't sound like, like oil field, but what it means is we're all gonna be working in an integrated fashion towards business outcomes. That That's, that's yeah. the whole gist of it. Um, I want to I want to go um, out to the audience question, and um, I, I want to start with oilfield digitalization has been around for 15 years, and progress was very slow. Did it take COVID to get to the top of leadership's attention? Was the existing business case too weak? And Rob, I think I'm going to throw that one to you. I think, um, I mean, Han mentioned it earlier on in one of his answers. I mean, the key thing here is mindset. I mean, the digital, the tech, the tools, all of that, that's not been the issue at all. That's all been there and available. The issue is we've just not wanted to change our own mindset and say, right, we need to work in different ways or apply this in different ways. Um, and that's that's been the biggest problem. And we had something within BP, I guess, back in just post the merger with, with uh, Amico and Arco, so it must have been early 2000s, almost 20 years ago, called Field of the Future. Um, and, and it was so difficult to get teams to do that. And we would, put, in projects organization, we put all of this kit in place and you could actually run things from onshore, remote operations. 
but they still wanted a control center, you know, an ops, an ops center offshore as well. And you, you'd end up with two, and they wouldn't shut the one down offshore and run it for onshore. So it's just, it was mindset. It was nothing to do with the tech or the uh, availability. And I would say mindset across the whole company. I wouldn't say not just leaders, but it is in leaders, but actually across the whole the whole company. I mean, so the biggest thing we're seeing, you know, this digital transformation, we're saying it's a people transformation. Actually, that's what it is. It's not the tech. It's making sure everybody understands it's going to be different. I think what COVID does, it just forces it. I mean, you can't physically go to the office or it's difficult to get people offshore. So people are being really inventive and creative and finding ways of changing the way they work um, on the fly. And it's that's the exciting bit. I think people can now see what's possible. Certainly our organization, we moved to from Skype to Teams sort of during last year and just about finished it before we got locked down. And it's been brilliant. I mean, we've got 70,000 people on Teams and fingers crossed, hopefully it doesn't drop later, but it's been working really, really well. And frankly, the organization has been really surprised that it works. I mean, that's the thing that for the first six weeks, everybody said, oh, it's great. Teams is working. We can see you. We can talk. I mean, so yeah, that it should be the basics but it's just forcing people to think in a different way yeah and i i, I mean it it's it's just amazing to me you know that yeah this stuff does work and people people and organizations as a whole have learned that and i i think the business case has been there always but being forced to use something, I, I think, has just shown us that we can, you know, we can go boldly where others have already gone when it comes to using this technology. Um, Hanny or Shaq, I'm going to let one of you answer this one. What, what, if anything, can you say to mass activist movements actively working to dismantle a fossil fuel-based company in terms of how we can cooperate to create a sustainable civilization? Either one of you want to take that one? I'm going to, I'll start and then, and then Hani, I'd love to hear from, from all of you. And, and Jim, I think you should, should add to this as, as the facilitator. So, you know, let's face it, you know, we are in uncharted times. It is a new era. The, we're seeing, I think, because of digital, a, you're seeing all across the board oil and gas companies reducing their methane. And that's been through data transparency, data stewardship. You have aerial methane, you have satellite drones, you have new sensors, you're being able to sense an environment, and you're seeing that happen. You're also seeing, I think, with the footprint that we have, we all know that we have a responsibility to make it a better world. And part of that is energy and people having abundant and abundant source of energy for our manufacturing, for the quality of life. And so how we do that over the next 10 years or 20 years is really upon us. And, and I don't think, you know, people have this definition of, well, this is what an upstream oil and gas company is today. Or we used to say, well, this is what an analyst is today. And now, we have data scientists and they're creating these very thoughtful models about prediction. You know, I'm seeing some people that are from the former upstream unconventional. There's a guy named Dr. Howard Schmidt from Rice, and he's trying to figure out how to generate power and storage in an unconventional well down in Eagleford. So you're seeing these things and you go, you know, it only took us 10 years to think about becoming dependent on all of these other sources of energy and now we have an abundance and so i hope that we take through digital both environmental stewardship but also think about how we can use our existing footprint and facilities both to reduce but also come up with ways to work closely with others in energy honey i know shell okay. game changers and bp you guys have done amazing work so you guys should really comment on this yeah i I, I, don't worry, I wasn't letting them off the hook. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I mean, Shell has been uh, preparing for these challenges of a lower carbon future for some years now. Uh, Shell has been big and continues to be big on scenario planning. 
And it's an effective way to think of the different possibilities and sort of prepare resilience for those possibilities. And so we've been using, you know, know-how, technology, and innovation. You mentioned Game Changer. Actually, early on, it had looked into that. But the intent is to deliver more cleaner energy, more and cleaner energy, um, essentially to help the world's, uh, you know, growing needs and find ways to use existing energy sources more efficiently. It's a combination of those two. So, of course, there's the aspiration to decarbonize and lower the impact on the environment, absolutely. Uh, there's a recognition that to go there, you know, there's some bridges to be crossed. And how we do that is a combination of multitude of, of efforts, not a singular one. So this both, you know, investment in renewables as well as making the use of existing uh, resources uh, cleaner and less impactful to the environment. Rob, anything you would add before I move us on? No, I agree with both what uh, Shaq and Han said. I mean, you know, there is an energy transition going on. Um, I think COVID will probably accelerate that. Um, that's certainly what we're thinking about within BP. Um, there's all the new businesses, the hydrogen, the wind, the, the solar, the biofuels, all of the other things that we looked at. But, but you know, from my perspective, oil and gas is going to be around for at least another 30 years. I mean, I can't. I'm 56 years old, so I'm probably my 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 horizon is probably about 10 years, I guess, in terms of work. Um, but it's going to be around for 30 years. But but it's got to get way more efficient. To what Annie was saying, just gets needs to be more and more efficient. That's why the digital transformation is so key because with digital and data science and predictive analytics and all those things, it can become just so, so more efficient. And, and that includes sort of emissions and energy management and all of those other other things that, uh, that we can work on. And we're actively, I don't know, Shell are as well and, and others. So we're actively working on that. And the, the drive will be to just become way, way more efficient in every aspect of the business, but including you know, CO2 and methane. And and I, I would just say, I, I think the challenges that the industry face are super exciting. And, you know, because we have to, like you said, Rob, we're going to need fossil fuels for quite a while. And so we need the best and brightest to help us deliver on, on the fossil fuels in the most low carbon, low footprint way possible. So, so I think you know data science, the new the the new types of roles that we're going to have in oil and gas, all contribute to this more sustainable way of producing the fossil fuels. So, I, I I think it's it's super critical for us as an industry to to really explain the challenges and opportunities for these new workers and existing workers about oil and gas because it, it there's a lot of exciting things that are ongoing. Uh, where we, we, like I said, we need the best and brightest. Um, the next the next question I have on here, um, I think, I think Rob, I'm going to lob this one to you. Um, it is from Mario Ardila in Colombia, and he says, one of the fundamental problems for the successful imp implementation of a digital oil field is related to how to change within the organization from cost of data to value of data. How, how has your journey been to achieve this change? And I know, Jack, you and Hanny will have something to pile on to that one. I have no doubt. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, that's very, very well said. As you know, one of the countries I did work in was Colombia. So I, when BP had its operations down in Colombia, so I worked there for about 18 months, uh, 15, 15 years ago, so I know it well. Um, absolutely, I mean, certainly within BP, part of the issue we've had uh, over the last probably five years is I, I would call it IT, IT and S generally, information technology is being viewed as a cost rather than as a value enabler. Um, and that's probably been part of the biggest change is actually, and that's why we've changed and we're calling it now digital. We don't, we don't use the word ITNS anymore as, as we go through this transition. We're going to call it digital to try and get people thinking in a different way. It's not about cost. It's about what value that enables. And, and that's both data, which is absolutely key, key part of that. And frankly, you know, I'll admit two years ago, I really didn't understand data at all. I knew it was really important. And I you know, worked in projects and we had information management and everything else. But I just couldn't comprehend how important it was. And having done this role for the last 16 months and been drinking from the fire hose, it, 
it's just so you know without that you really can't deliver the value and particularly if you want to scale if you want to scale across a company the size of bp with whatever we've got um 32 you know oil and gas assets around the world eight refineries and six petrochemical facilities you you've got to have that consistency with the data and then ability to to scale whatever digital products you come up with so that's that's the big change it, what really helps is if the top person in the company understands that. So we were very fortunate in the upstream that Bernard Looney, he was the chief executive of the upstream for the past four years, really got that. Uh, he, un he understood that. He didn't know the detail, but he just knew it was really important. He spent a lot of time looking out at other industries, external industries outside of ours, and just seeing that value and coming in and saying, no, no, we need to modernize, we need to transform data, digital, all of the you know, different ways of working, agile, all of these different things were important. So it, it's it's a mindset shift. You really need to make sure the top person does it as well. Now, of course, he's the chief executive of BP and, and, and he's able to do that. We see quite a difference between what we've been doing in the upstream for the last three and a half years and, and our downstream part, which has very much been a lean, you know, cost-driven type of business. And you can actually see that. And that's part of what we're working through now as we try and bring it all together in a single BP mm. without an upstream and a downstream. Sounds like you got a lot of fun ahead of you, Rob. Oh, I, endless fun. Every day is just lots more fun than I can deal with. It's wonderful. <laughs> Shaq or Hanny, any any thoughts on on the the on the on that topic? I know you do. Yeah, I know Mario actually uh, personally, but uh, the part of um, the journey towards being more value focused is to become more outcome. -focused. Okay, because cost is what you pay, value is what you get. He should know that, having been in Slumberger for many years. But uh, it's by ensuring, in our case, that the business owns digital, owns the digital agenda, that ensures customer centricity, which is a key component of digital transformation, and the other key component, integration into the business. Whereas, you know, historically, yes, we, you know, all companies have been doing some sort of digitally related activities. But many of these have, as Rob pointed out uh, quite accurately, have resided perhaps in an IT function or you know a data management function, and it was kind of siloed, kind of self-propagated, self-sustaining. Uh, this is different. Uh, there is at least this has happened over the last five years in most large organizations and medium-sized ones. They've realized that you've got to get closer to the customer. You've got to focus on the outcomes, the business outcomes. So customer centricity and integration into the business are key, and that is what's going to ensure the value, really, because the businesses then will choose, prioritize, and fund those activities that are most relevant to the outcomes. And then, of course, in most organizations, you know, as large as ours or BP, you still need some sort of uh, central orchestration, but it's a light touch, and it's more about enabling acceleration and learnings across the organization, it's uh, also, you know, about uh, choosing, you know, uh, differentiating processes and setting up maybe incubators or accelerators for those. But the business still owns the journey. At least that's the way we've chosen to do it uh, at Shell. Hmm. Hey, Shaq, uh, for time purposes, I'm going to give you another question. Um, I in e, in the E and P world, which segments of the business do you see as being the furthest ahead on digital and which have the furthest to go? You heard Annie talk about silos and the matrix organizations. Do, do you see certain segments ahead and others behind? Yeah, yes, and this is a great question. So, uh, you know, one, one thing I think that's really helped, if you look at like, they're very hard problems to go solve, but we talk about frack optimization, well spacing in the subsurface. These are very expensive data sets to go get um, and very hard problems. And I think what's really helped accelerate the journey has there's been a number of startups with really smart people. So if you can come up with ways, and I think we've seen this, uh, of partnering with some of these smaller entrepreneurial digital companies to really work through some of the, with a strong digital team internally, data science and subject matter experts, 
we've seen huge gains. We've seen that also in drilling. We've seen where we've done taking because of digital workflows and tools, we've seen drilling go, you know, when we first started, we would be at 40 or 50 days. And now, you know, you're in the teens and we look at production and that has kept up, although the time required where I still see a huge amount of struggle. And this is where I think there's kind of this new era of startups and entrepreneurs thinking about spatial sensing, thinking about the hybrid cloud and how can you, and beyond just IoT, but connecting those. And that really comes when we talk about environmental um, stewardship and methane. And people think this is a very hard problem to solve. You know, operationally, you can see it and go fix it, but how do you start to even design facilities that don't even have that footprint, right? So, you know, Jim, so I, I think I've seen a lot of really creative ideas on this, but this is going to require a huge, and it's not just one company, it's going to be the industry, but it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for, for digital um, and how we think about that. So I'm excited about that. Okay, I, I'm going to, I'm going to keep us moving. Um, I, I, I'm going to answer a question, guys. How about that? Is that all right? Can I answer one of these questions? And, and then just correct me if I'm wrong. I know all three of you and you'd be happy to do, <laughs> do that. Um, who should be accountable to, the, to digital, the business or IT? In my humble opinion, if it's not driven by the business, it's not going to stick. Short and sweet answer. You, you got, I mean, it's a team effort, but if it's not driven by, by the business to make more money, to keep people safe or protect the environment, it, it, it just will never get the traction. And I think, Rob, it goes to your point about you need the person at the top to say this matters. And that's, that's a business person. That, that, that's my view. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is certainly within up, in Upstream Digital, we've tried to break, bring the business into us. So it's an amalgam of what was ITNS, what was data, and actually the business. So we, we do it together um, with the business. So it's not this one or that one. It's actually sort of a integrated, participative way in working. It's different. It's not command and control at all. It's, it's mm -hmm. bringing it all together and making the right sort of prioritization. I'm looking at the questions here. Uh, let me see here. Man, there's just so many. I'm trying to find one. That... Yeah, and then and just while you find the next one, <clears throat> I just wanted to piggyback on what Rob just said. Um, I think many of the learnings as we execute digital particularly from agile ways of working. For instance, uh, <clears throat> those are, who are employing Scrum methodologies, they recognize that the Scrum master is not the master as in the sense of, you know, the owner or the dictator in some fashion. They're actually the guardian. They're actually the protector. You know, they, they, they shield the team and allow them to do their thing without, in, you know, unnecessary distractions from the outside. But if you carry that same thought, to actually the concept of you know uh, the servant leader basically at large, uh, it's it's actually a transformation in ways of working and in leadership behaviors at large that I think we'll borrow and learn from agile ways of working. Yeah, and you'll you'll see that um, I think the C, you know CEOs that get it and are driving their teams, they're really trying to support those groups and they're trying to make those artificial you know, where can collisions can happen, you can have that space and time. Um, you know, you think about doing these these pilots and sprints to show value, whether that's on, you know, digital, I think digital field ticketing, um, that's been something that, you know, people talked about and everyone's doing it. But but the, that leadership piece completely matters. And you know, people have to think it's not going to necessarily happen in three months. So how do you have, a, you expect results every quarter, but how do you give room for that team to get that ultimate value? So.
So next question, um, and I'll let any of you just raise your hand and take this. How do you see the role of service companies and startups in your digital transformation or in digital transformation of the industry? Yeah, I, I can take a stab at that uh, because <clears throat> I, I have been and remain a big believer in partnerships in general, okay? It takes more than two to tango in this case. So I, I, I think really to thrive in digital, you need the full ecosystem players. And, and that includes, you know, the academia for doing basic research because that's really who's left to do basic research at the moment. You need the technology companies to contribute, you know, their uh, latest uh, uh, tools and technologies. You need the uh, service providers because they're going to integrate that with their offering. And you need, of course, the internal part of the capability uh, matrix here uh, because you need to build in-house capabilities so that you're an intelligent consumer, you, you're a discerning integrator. But that doesn't mean, because there's some confusion about that, that you do everything yourself. Rather, it's about really leveraging the full parts of the ecosystem. And it means having, you know, uh, uh, you know, strategic partnerships where it makes sense and having a more open playground for everyone to contribute, startups and, 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 and small innovators alike where it makes sense. Uh, as an example, I'll point out to uh, the OSU, which is the Open Subsurface Data Universe. It's a very worthy effort. For those of you not familiar with it, please go to the website to learn more but it's very interesting it's gone in a couple of years to a very rich ecosystem more than 500 players all the major operators all the major service providers all the major technology companies and a host of startups are there this is great and this is a good model for us to learn from i think i i would agree the next the next question we have um is on it, this is a very specific question, so if, if each of you could just give an example, uh, one example. Um, and it, there's several questions in here that are that are pretty granular, which wasn't necessarily the intent, but I'm going to give you all a chance to be granular on this one. Um, what problems are solved with data analysis and gathering? Just choose one. Don't, don't, you, you can't go through a laundry list of successes. Please just choose one. I mean, the one I, I, I would choose within BP, and we talk about it externally as well, and this, this started before my time, so I certainly can't claim any successes. A tool we've done called Apex, um, and again, to Hanny's um, um, you know, views earlier, we, we, we didn't do that ourselves. We did that in partnership with Palantir. Um, it took us quite a lot of time to do that, but that's very much around data, getting hold of the data <clears throat> and then doing the production optimization through the whole you know, reservoir, through the, the well and then the flow lines into, um, into the production facility. So that was one where data was the absolute key. It, it was very difficult at first. This was our first real attempt. I guess this was probably 2015. We started maybe even 2014. And it was like a complete different language. And certainly with the Palantir guys, we, we would describe them now as they were data insurgents. That's what they did because they'd come in and they'd go and try and get the data. And of course, it was trapped within our systems. But that's the one where we, that's the one, you know, we, we, we've had a lot of success with, but it's very much a data, data, anal, data access, data analytics, modeling back into how we, how we operate our facilities and real, real business value. And we've, we've been running with that for the last, four years now in terms of our kind of Jack? So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to talk about um, production optimization and what we talk about analytics and that's you're doing something where it already happened. So what I what I would say is we're finding more value in taking all of those different IoT systems and trying to focus on how are we making decisions in real time? So that that I think is kind of the net where we need to be going, um, regardless of the different systems. And to do that, you know, you're pushing up against of data fusion and how do you have disparate data sources to bring those into one platform? So 
you know, production optimization is one that I think is is right there. Uh, and and for many many folks, and then I think there's also, you know, um, optimizing um, chemicals using collecting that data, and that's been a I think a big win for many operators. And then I'm going to go back to obviously on drilling. I think there's there's number and numerous um, examples on that. And I, I want to build on what you're saying. Um, there's someone out there that has said, please be specific about the tech. What so far I just heard a lot of chat about transformation, plant forms, essentials, exciting, et cetera, but no one about particulars haven't even heard the word SCADA yet. You, you don't do production optimization without real-time data. It, it, it just doesn't happen. You don't do route optimization without real-time data. So the, the examples you guys are talking about are, are very in the crosshairs of pretty, pretty detailed field design, pad design of how we're going to operate. So I, I just wanted to, to make sure that Robert's aware we're addressing that particular piece of, of what he's saying. That's a very particular example, Jack, that you're building on. Same with you, Rob. Hanny, anything you would add? Yeah, I just wanted to add one other thought that um, for, for large organizations, it's still uh, critical, and this is a tough thing to do, by the way, to balance, um, you know, sort of uh, the outcome-driven activities, driven kind of the businesses, uh, which tend to be, you know, shorter term, smaller efforts with more foundational capability building too. So we've got this sort of balance between what we call, uh, you know, the right to the left and with the left to the right, right to the left being, you know, the outcome going back to the source, the data, and the other way is you still need some foundation. So as an example of the balancing act that needs to be done sort of mandating some standards um, is for instance uh, what we've been doing with uh, data you know the, the, the OSDU that I mentioned earlier but also uh, in terms of partnerships as well so for example uh, in the realm of AI and in the realm of uh, proactive health monitoring of equipment um, uh, Shell uh, selected the C3 AI it's a company uh, as the sort of the AI platform to enable and accelerate digital transformation at a scale, because that's important. You need to do it at scale and you need to deploy it across the organization. And so that runs, uh, that platform runs on Microsoft Azure. So somebody, people wanted some specifics about technology, that's the specific right there. And, and the idea there is by choosing such a platform and sort of uh, uh, um, standardizing that across both upstream and downstream, you can more rapidly scale and replicate AI and machine learning applications, uh, particularly focused in this case on HSE and uh, health safety and environment, as well as asset performance. Okay, so that's a specific case of a partnership oriented to deploy at scale uh, in a specific uh, domain. Mm. Mm. Question, question for, I'm going to throw this at, at you, Rob. How <clears throat> would, would you feel comfortable, or do you, let me not, not would you, do you uh, feel comfortable working on your projects using a cloud platform, or would you feel, still feel some concerns related to the security IP protection? I've, I've heard a lot of, of people within oil and gas have that same question, so I'd, I'd like to hear your opinion. Yeah, I'd certainly talk about it. I mean, the, the BP strategy is cloud first. So, you know, we really are pushing that as a cloud transformation program that's been underway for probably the last three years. We're still not there yet, but trying to put everything in uh, into the cloud. I guess at the moment we've got a multi-cloud strategy. So from an upstream perspective, we're, and he talked about Azure, we're in Microsoft Azure. We've actually moved most of our things within the upstream is now actually in the cloud. Um, and, and and one of the very specific things we've moved, sort of the Slumberger Petrel um, toolkit, that's actually all in our Azure cloud. We we did that. It was one of the bits of feedback from our uh, Hurricane Harvey sort of two and a half years ago when everybody was trying, all the reservoir engineers were trying to work from home and they couldn't because all the chili boxes were sitting in the office. Um, and so we've actually put that into the cloud. Obviously, the digital security guys are involved in that and making sure it's all set up and we've got all the right um, 
protection, everything else. So we can't just go and do it, but we've got to work within our digital security team as well. But we, I mean, that's our drive, that's our strategy, um, and you know, more and more, that's what's going to what's going to go into the cloud. But the, the beauty is, with the pandemic, we didn't, you know, skip a beat. Our, our reservoir engineers are they're calling up virtual machines just through their normal laptop at home. Some of them are actually doing it on their phone. You know, they they, they talked about actually being sitting in the car park and you can actually access it through their phone. So that for us, it's it, it's and it's been a huge uh, thing over the last 12 weeks with the lockdown of, of the you know the reservoir engineers and the exploration folks saying, wow, isn't it wonderful? And, and yes, it is, but it's it's pretty fundamental, which is put up in the cloud. So uh, just for the audience and, and for the panelists, we're going to go five minutes over. I, I have, there's, there's a question I'd like to throw at Shaq, you and Hanny, and it comes from the audience about what, what is your view of, you know, within, within the upstream community, we've always viewed just about every piece of data we ever created as proprietary. Um, that's not necessarily true. What, what is you two's view on sharing of data with, the ecosystem or service provider. Shaq, I'll let you go first. You know, I think this is the number one issue that we have to talk about and work on because, you know, I'll take, you know, Doyle Kendall, who leads our, you know, uh, machine learning group and our, even our, and our CEO. It's like, they, it's so expensive to get these data sets again. And if you're a smaller operator, the way that you're going to <clears throat> assume that sharing data means that each of those organizations, or even you know, if you're working with a startup, sharing that data, one, transparency, you can get to the answer. Two, by sharing that, you leverage your data points, because you know, we're not like a consumer industry that has thousands <laughs> of data points to run these very sophisticated predictions and automation. So when you can pull data together, and share it, the competition is gonna be on how do you interpret and make the decisions and how well do you operate your business? So we would advocate for sharing that data. Now, you know, that's not always what some of our peers would say, but from our standpoint with operators, you're smaller, you have to by necessity band together to do that. Annie? Yeah, and uh, you know, very well put, uh, Shaq. <clears throat> I'll just uh, add to that that, of course, uh, different types of data are you know slightly different how you might want to treat them. Uh, but in general, <clears throat> I, I do believe in uh, in a greater amount of sharing than traditionally has been. And <clears throat> the reason for that, I think, the highest level of digital transformation occur when you sort of reinvent your how you collaborate and how you interact with both your customers, your suppliers, uh, and basically you reinvent your business models. And, and you cannot really do that without figuring out how to collaborate with data differently. <clears throat> so, you know, you can have a provider, for example, instead of providing you just hardware, you provide value added services based on both the hardware and the IoT measurements that they collect, but because they understand the, the equipment best, they can provide you know, proactive health monitoring and other things. And that's a transaction you carry out. There are a few examples about that in the industry, too few in my, in, for my liking. I think we can do a lot better. And I think the, <clears throat> the, uh, the times we're in will force that level of collaboration more. That's a silver lining, I guess, of, uh, of what's happening, is that we will have to collaborate more to survive, actually. One, one question towards you, Rob, because I know that you've talked to this, um, is around uh, upskilling. <clears throat> How has that worked at BP? Uh, and, and do you feel it's been successful? How has it been taken in by the, by the employees? Talk about that briefly, and then I'm going to send you all the leadership question to wrap us up. <clears throat> yeah, I would say it's there's, it's been successful in certain areas, certainly not universally successful. I mean, the one area where it has been successful is in data science. And I think Shaq <clears throat> earlier was talking about sort of reservoir engineers, petroleum engineers. There's a real affinity with what that, you know, our subsurface 
teams do and you know it's hard math and therefore it gets into algorithms and machine learning and, and data science so that's the area where we have the biggest upskilling um we created a, a data science cop a community of practice three years ago there's over 1500 mm -hmm. people joined it so it's you know voluntary it's not it's not mandatory so over 1500 people within the company have joined We've just um, started to fill in um, data science roles within my team, and we've advertised those. We thought initially we may need to get some from outside. We had overwhelming number. I mean, we, we, we tested the technical skills of these people and then the behavioral skills, and we had something like almost 100 people were ready right now to do <laughs> data science roles. They actually didn't need any upskilling because they'd been upskilling themselves over the last three years in their current roles they were working. A lot of them were in in you know in subservice. Some were there are upstream technology area as well. So I think data science is the one that's been really, really successful. The you know what I'd really want to get after, and I guess this is going to be into the new reinvent VP organization, is how can we upskill into software engineers or architects or those sorts of things, which does happen in other industries, but we've We've struggled to do that so far. I think that's going to be a big, big focus of our of our new digital organization in the in the new structure of people. Well, Rob, thank you for that. And now um, let's, I'm going to throw this at Shaq first, and then Hanny, and then you, Rob. It's like we've talked about the oil field of the future and and new ways of working. We've we've talked at a high level about <clears throat> things management. We've gotten specific about you know <clears throat> detail examples, but like we said at the beginning we're we're going to be it's a different place it's a different world and i got a note from from someone in the audience it's a, it, you know the future is for the bold well to me that means bold leadership and and it's a change in leadership as we move in the industry from deep domain expertise leadership to broad leadership and multiple disciplines and multiple generations that as as we're going to enable the oil field of the future um jack go first give us a couple of behaviors that you see is really critical for leaders in the future and that can be leaders at any level and then like i said hanny you follow her and rob you you follow uh hanny yeah you know so I guess from the CEO, and this is what Tom, our CEO, you know, he asked himself is, do we have a platform that we're providing for our data science team to make an impact? Are we ensuring that, you know, how do you break down the communication barriers? You know, so you have to think about it. People speak differently, communicate differently. That is like so key. And then you have to say, can they leverage expertise outside of the organization everyone wrestles with this but let's all face it not all the talent resides in any one organization so if you want to drive success and really have this at the forefront of your company you're going to have to think about how do you partner with whether that's with service companies other operators organizations and entrepreneurs and you know do you make wise decisions on buying versus building and you know what's your metric for success and does everyone understand what your definition is versus the others i think that you know being bold is a great way to think about this because it does require bold leadership because by doing that you're going to have some very entrenched groups that aren't going to like that and they're going to and they're going to you know i think i walked down the hall and it's like you know, many of us that when we're trying to champion our data scientists and our digital transformation teams and trying to champion people that take those brave risks inside, you got to say, how can I help you? Like that's like, what can I do? Can, is there a communication issue that I can help clear up? Or is it, do you have the resource? And if you don't have the resource or talent inside, how can we work outside? So it's going to be tough. And, and I don't think it's, it's easy, but you know, with COVID and everything else that's going on, and we're having some really, I think, intense and much needed conversations in our in our country. And I think it's causing us to have some <laughs> conversations inside our organizations. It's it's interesting with Zoom and Teams, 
we're now starting, you know, we're all apart and we're getting this time to reflect and, and you're seeing like these changes are happening now. It's a, it's a new day. Yeah. Annie, thoughts on the leadership behaviors? Yeah, I, I think it's happening as we speak and we'll continue to accelerate, you know, this post COVID-19 world. I think Rob gave the example of BP. I, I suspect most organizations are going to, who will go through some form of transformation along the same lines. The good news is it's all in the right direction, I believe. So going from organizations as these sort of inflexible machines where you have you know, silos and leadership is about top-down hierarchy you know, uh, and detailed instruction to a more uh, organic system, if you like. You know, basically the boxes and lines are less important. There's more focus on the action. The teams are built around end-to-end -end accountability, learning from agile ways of working, and you know there's quick changes and flexible resources that are made available to deliver uh, the uh, objectives. And then the, the role of leadership then becomes more about showing direction and enabling action, as opposed to you know managing the up and down flow. So it's a it's a different uh, mindset. It's 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 happening or has been happening, and I think it will accelerate because of the nature of the times we're in anyway. Like you couldn't really do command and control, you know, in this virtual environment very well. It kind of forces you towards being more outcome driven and being more uh, flexible in how people collaborate together and team up. So that's a silver lining again. Yeah, Jim, I fully agree with what Hanny just said and Jack as well. I mean, Bernard's trying to move the whole company to working in a more agile way. Um, he, he's doing that by he is changing the span of control. So he's instead of people having five or six direct reports, which is historically what we had, it's 10 to 12. And you can't manage to what Penny just said. You can't manage the same way if you've got 10 or 12 direct reports. It's just not possible. So it almost flips it the other way up. So I think Shaq earlier on mentioned servant leadership. It's about the leader supporting the team and the team making the decision, whereas historically the leaders made, made the decision. So it's really the, the leader supporting the team, you know, go and join their, you know, daily ceremonies, their, their you know, their, their sprint reviews, the stand-ups, whatever, and just say, well, what are the blockers? What can I do for help? Um, what are the blockers? What are the impediments? What can I get out of the way for, for you? So it's a, it's a different way of working. It's a different sort of question to ask for the team. And basically the team end up solving the problems and making the decisions. It's not not the, the leader that makes it. I mean, the, the other thing I would say, I, I like to be bold. I mean, I, I would say dive right in. Yes, just try to have an open mind, dive right in, learn. Um, it's not as difficult as you think. I think Shaq was talking about it. It's really not that difficult. Just go and learn. There's lots of stuff out there. Um, what I do is I talk to my kids. You know, I, if, if I've got a, you know, I've got a 17 year old and a 20 year old, if I've got a problem on, on tech, or I, I just go and talk to them because they, they, they yeah. can show me how to do all sorts of stuff. So, it, you know, it, it isn't that difficult. You just, it's, it's uncomfortable because you're not used to it. You just got to go and try and then just have a lot of fun with it. It really is a lot of fun. Stuff I'm working on now, I never thought I was working on. Well, and I, yeah, to, I would. Just I, uh, one last thought uh, to yeah, Rob's point there. Um, speaking about, uh, so, because I have a 17 year old as well, so I have to wake him up actually right after this. But, uh, you know, I've got him set up with an Audacity, you know, machine learning uh, course uh, this summer. And actually, I'm, I've been taking several myself, actually, through this, all this lockdown, both on machine learning and other things. There's never a time to stop learning, actually. I, you know, we've got to continue learning. The lifetime of learning is really the, the way of the future, yeah? So both myself and my son are, are undergoing the same learnings. <laughs> Well, thank you guys. I, and I would say to me, what's going to be really important in our leadership, it sounds, I know, odd in a digital transformation is the ability to connect with people. This, this is about the human being aspect. That's how digital transformation happens. That's how new ways of working happens, is, is getting trust in human beings. And I think that is a huge leadership challenge for us. It's definitely happening. And thank you guys so much. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. We got so many questions we couldn't get to. I appreciate you just taking the fastballs I was throwing at you. I think you did a great job.
Jade, would you mind wrapping us up, please, ma'am? I shall. Um, yeah, sorry, that is all we have time for. Um, apologies for the technical issues in the beginning. Seemed our system crashed in the background. So thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, I feel like we've made up the time at the end there, so that's good. Um, on a personal note, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who's joined us across the series. Today, there was a record breaking 1500 of you signed up. So it's just really great to see such a wide engagement across the whole of the upstream community. Um, the full recording will be sent to your inboxes within a week or so. I think today's topic in particular has been especially valuable. So as always, feel free to share the recordings with your colleagues and clients and you know, spread the knowledge as much as possible. Um, huge thanks to Rob, Shaq and Hani for participating today. It's really such a privilege to hear your insight on this topic. And um, of course, a special thanks to Jim for hosting the series as a whole. It's been a pleasure to have you on board. Um, finally, we, had, we did have so many questions we didn't manage to get to today, but don't think that we are leaving you guys here empty handed. As an exclusive treat, we have given everyone who signed up today to today's episode free access to the full two day program at this year's Data Driven Drilling and Production Virtual Conference, which will be taking place um, on October 20th and 21st. If you head over to www upstreamintel.com forward slash data, you'll be able to see the full agenda, current speaker lineup and all of the past attendees um, and much more. So in the meantime, be sure to keep your eyes peeled and ears pricked for more content between now and October. And uh, do let us know if you want to get involved. We're always welcome to um, suggestions. So for now, thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks to our panelists. And of course, stay safe, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks.